So um, let's uh, let's get uh, let's going. Remarkably, we are only a few minutes uh, behind schedule. It's uh, late in, 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 in on, on, on a Friday afternoon, and I must say that uh, all of you sitting here in the audience, uh, very interested in, interested in macroprudential issues, are a very very patient bunch, given that it's 4 p.m. and on, on a Friday uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to give a long speech to start start out because uh, I think it's much better if we just move to the to the to the panelists. Uh, as I kind of hinted this morning, I I work in the engine room of the ESRB and I deal with macroprudential issues from that perspective and 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 also from a national national perspective. So maybe I add a few few words. Uh, down the road once the panelists have, have gotten going uh, explaining how they look at macroprudential policy in, uh, in, 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 in practice. But before we get into that, just a quick comment to the two the to, to, to previous uh, speakers, uh, being both involved on the ESRB side and being ch the chairman of the Basel Committee. Uh, I 100% agree the areas you have chosen are seriously under-researched. And that's an issue in, it, in itself, because when you produce these uh, rules and regulations, you have like 50 to 70 people in the room. You keep churning and churning for years and years. And that's, uh, that's a negotiation. Uh, but uh, it's very, very good if outsiders keep track of the end result, because uh, sometimes we get it right, right uh, sometimes uh, not. Not so right, and, and and that's why it's very very helpful if out, outsiders try to understand what is uh, happening in the in the system. So let's get going. We have here uh, Matthias de Montrimpo, who is the uh, vice governor of the National Bank of Belgium, uh, and he's dealing with macroprudential issues from uh, from a Belgian perspective, not not the least thinking about risk weights and things like that, how to deal with macroprudential measures. Richard Portes, a well-known professor at LSC, here in, in his role as the, ES, as, as the chair of the Advisory Scientific Committee. And also, you have done a lot of work on, on, on shadow banking in an ESRB context. Paul Tucker, who has, he was currently chair of the Systemic Risk Council, but has a ton of practical experience when it comes to dealing with financial sector issues and financial stability issues in its broadest sense. And last but not least, Anneli Tuominen, uh, who is Director General of the Finnish FSA, where you're also uh, trying to figure out what to do and what not to do in the real world when it comes to using macro, macro prudential uh, uh, measures. So Matthias, uh, please, uh, please go ahead and then we'll, 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 we'll go through the panelists and then we'll discuss among ourselves and with the audience. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's great to be invited uh, to this uh, first conference, which is, uh, I think, as impressive as the ESRB is. Uh, I think there was a very nice uh, talk this morning by Stefan and very positive about, uh, about the ESRB, and I think it's really well deserved. Uh, I like in particular the fact that uh, 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 you said, Stefan, that uh, the ESRB is kind of uh, vastly improving the macroprudential culture in, in Europe. And of course, uh, it has to do with uh, the general board chaired by, by Mario. It has to do, of course, with Francesco and his team. It also has to do a lot with, it was said by Francesco, by the ATC, uh, chaired by, by you, Stefan. And also, I think, uh, by the Advisory Scientific Council, uh, Committee, which I think is, uh, is a great, uh, a great uh, innovation, because it's not the uh, the uh, the tradition in uh, European uh, economics that uh, the you know, economic policy that uh, you had such a high level and so committed group of academics that they are really helping and I think uh, it's really uh, showing that uh, this interaction means that one plus one equals three in this case so I think it's uh, it's really important um, now in terms of I've uh, been asked to talk about uh, macroprudential experiences. And of course, uh, thanks to, and that was extremely important, was already said, uh, thanks to the SRB, we have all, uh, in all member states, we have uh, set up uh, national macroprudential authorities. And in, in the case of Belgium, it's the National Bank of Belgium. And therefore, uh, we have indeed uh, 
started doing some, uh, taking some measures. I mean, these, these are not uh, earth-shattering measures, uh, but I think there are some uh, interesting, uh, interesting dimensions which I think are, are relevant, and I will uh, briefly discuss them. Um, so basically, we have done two things so far. Um, domestic CFI buffers and risk weight add-ons for, for real estate. Very quickly, so one on the, the structural part, the domestic CFI buffers, and one on the cyclical part. Um, and uh, to make it very short, I think the, uh, the Basel Committee has done very good work on uh, defining this uh, GCF methodology, and uh, we have uh, benefited from, from that, and we have uh, adapted it to, to Belgium, and I think uh, that works well, and you don't hear many, um, many uh, discussions about that. Uh, on uh, risk weight add-ons, so the, uh, the cyclical part, I think there uh, we share, like a number of countries, the, the um, criticism about the counter-cyclical capital buffer, which uh, is, uh, at least for our country, not, uh, not granular enough. Uh, basically, uh, one number is not enough in a world where, uh, like in Belgium, we have uh, insufficient small and medium enterprise lending, but excessive real estate lending. So uh, uh, I think you need something which is more, more targeted. And so what we went for was this 50% uh, 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 real estate risk weight add-on. And there, and I think it was mentioned uh, already uh, yesterday uh, or, or today also, um, basically uh, we were a bit surprised that it was so tough to be allowed to do a risk weight add-on. So you had to go through uh, four, five, eight, and these kind of things. Uh, basically, I think uh, CR, CRD is uh, involved too much in micromanagement, but so you can do, uh, you can do floor for uh, LGD or PD, but you cannot do an add-on. Why? And I must say, I was not aware that we couldn't do that unless we asked for, uh, for exception, uh, exemption from both the SRB, which was quite cooperative, from EBA, OK, too, and the commission, less so. So basically, uh, the, you know, it's a whole uh, uh, previous debate about maximum harmonization and that. Uh, why should member states do things different uh, from what Europe is doing? Um, so in the end, we were allowed to do it. But frankly, I mean, at a conceptual point of view, uh, Floors uh, assume implicitly that the problem with the lending is for uh, the lower tail of the distribution, that is the, the, uh, the loans that the banks consider least risky. Now, it may be true, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily the case that, uh, indeed, uh, you're not penalizing the banks that are, in fact, more conservative in their lending. Uh, and more generally, we all like uh, risk sensitivity, but basically uh, introducing floors means you basically have a risk weight compression. It's not necessarily what you want to do. Our view was that, uh, you know, uh, so this is this 5% add-on uh, was applied to IRB banks. And so the view was uh, we are not going to uh, go into the detail of your models. We are agnostic about them. We are just taking, uh, basically, con uh, we are observing that uh, your risk weights are back-tested on periods where you didn't have a real estate crisis. And OK, in the past you didn't, but the future is not always like the past. So having a translation of your risk weight is, uh, as I say, an agnostic way of, uh, of uh, changing that. And I think, uh, so that was our idea. And uh, the good news is that we managed to convince all the European institutions that it was OK to do it. So, so far, so good. Uh, and I think we are, uh, we are happy with, uh, with that. Um, now, uh, as I say, this is not only a risk weight add-on. It's also targeting the, uh, the uh, real estate sector. Uh, which is where we had the excessive credit. Um, the idea is very simple, and I think a number uh, of uh, countries share this view, that uh, basically when risks are building up in specific segments in the credit market, well, then it makes sense to uh, go for more targeted instrument. In fact, there is empirical evidence, and I'll come back to that, suggesting that uh, credit cycles in different uh, uh, 
credit segments, and in particular household versus non-financial corporation, may not always be synchronized, and therefore you would need to go for sectoral countercyclical capital buffers. Um, in fact, there is evidence, in particular in uh, our last uh, financial stability review, there is a paper by uh, indeed uh, the backer, the Wachter Ferrari Pirovano, who's in the room, and uh, Van Nieuwenhuizen, uh, showing in particular, for example, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, the correlation uh, between the credit gaps which is you know, the instrument, the Basel instrument, credit gap for households and for non-financial corporation are in fact far from perfectly correlated. In Belgium, it's plus 0.54. In, uh, in Germany, it's plus 0.75. Finland, 0.69. France, 0.68. Italy, 0.37. It's even negative for Austria and the Netherlands. I think over that period, only Spain and Portugal, it's close to one. So basically, uh, I think it's important, and uh, as I say, we are definitely not alone in thinking that, to, to think about refining a bit uh, this, uh, this uh, concept of uh, counter-cyclical capital buffer to look also at more granular uh, credit uh, to GDP gaps. Then on the... Uh, another comment on the, the effect of the real estate uh, risk weight add-on. Um, as I said, uh, what we wanted to do is uh, raise it to, to all the banks, being agnostic about where in the distribution of uh, lending uh, the, the bias uh, uh, was. And uh, so basically we have in Belgium, thanks to the lack of a, uh, of a real estate crisis in the last decades, uh, we had a pretty low average uh, risk weight uh, from internal models on the uh, Belgian mortgage loans uh, at 10%. Now it's 15%. And in fact, uh, uh, we are thinking about uh, additional increases. Uh, our main objective was to increase banks' resilience. I mean, there, there was this, uh, this question yesterday about uh, what is the goal of uh, capital-based macroprudential policy. At some level, uh, the simple one is you give, uh, you start from higher, therefore the problem will be, uh, will be uh, less important. When it comes to uh, preventing a bubble, let's face it, uh, it's much more complicated and uh, I think uh, there uh, we have to, uh, I think, to agree with uh, Ricardo's uh, comment. Uh, um, so, uh, as I said, clearly the benefit is you gain on resilience. On the impact, and here I'm reporting on, uh, on recent work that is uh, about to be presented in our, in our conference uh, next month, uh, in terms of the, uh, the reduction of credit growth, this is, uh, this is definitely not, uh, not so obvious. Uh, clearly what we show is that uh, uh, more constrained banks are more affected and uh, they have increased lending spreads uh, more. Also banks that are more mortgage specialized. So I think all this is good because you're basically building the buffer more for banks that are more uh, specialized into that. Um, in the end, we are talking about limited impacts, so zero to 10 basis points of uh, lending spread. Uh, some banks, as I say, more capital constraint or more specialized in that uh, going up to, uh, I think, 15 basis points. Uh, I think, frankly, um, this is in line with uh, the many existing studies on the effect of uh, overall capital requirements on, uh, on the extent of lending, suggested that if you really want to uh, limit uh, a bubble, then uh, you probably want to go to uh, harder uh, borrower-based measures like LTV caps uh, in order to really uh, curb, curb the cycle. And I think there, in particular, I think uh, beyond this evidence for Belgium, uh, one very nice set of studies uh, concerns uh, Spain the use of dynamic provisioning, showing that, again, uh, dynamic provisioning, which was, uh, which was capital uh, cyclical buffer avant la lettre, uh, was good in uh, building up the, uh, the buffer uh, before the, uh, the bubble burst, but not really preventing the bubble. And in particular, one thing which is very complicated, as shown uh, 
uh, in these uh, Spanish papers, is that banks that are constrained may indeed uh, limit their lending, but uh, customers quickly go to another bank, which is not constrained, and then uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is tough. So don't expect too much on, the, on that. Uh, let's not be too ambitious on that. Finally, one comment on um, the institutional architecture of macroprudential policy within the banking union. Uh, as you know, uh, while for significant banks, the ECB is in charge of micro-prudential uh, supervision and uh, national competent authorities help. Uh, in terms of uh, macroprudential uh, policy, it is a shared competence between the ECB and the national macroprudential authority. And uh, indeed, it's a good idea. So uh, somehow the uh, financial stability people want the debate with the European Commission and the single market people, if I may, <laughs> if I may caricature. Uh, and so we are not in, uh, in maximum harmonization. The view is that indeed uh, it, there are uh, national or even regional uh, shocks. Uh, so I think that's good that, uh, that uh, national macroprudential authorities do exist. Uh, by the way, it's not just uh, the fact that we are in maybe a less than perfect monetary union. In the UK, they do uh, macroprudential policy on London real estate, I understand. So indeed, there may be, uh, there may be uh, pretty granular, uh, granular problems. I've always found it a bit funny that in the US, they don't do regional uh, macroprudential policy because clearly, uh, even though in 2007 there was a US-wide real estate bubble, very often it had been a real estate bubble in Florida or in Texas or in California, and so uh, I think uh, they could consider uh, regional uh, macroprudential policy. Now, uh, it is a shared competence with uh, this idea of asymmetry that uh, each side can top up, can be stricter than the other side, uh, but cannot undo a, a stricter uh, macroprudential stance at the other level. Now, at times people say that it's about uh, countering the, uh, the uh, inaction bias. Uh, when listening yesterday to John Cunliffe saying that, in his view, the biggest inaction bias is whether we will decrease the buffer in case of crisis, uh, I think that doesn't. Uh, no, I think, frankly, this top-up option is not about countering inaction bias per se. It's about countering excessive softness or insufficient strictness bias. It's the fact that we, uh, and I think, frankly, it makes sense uh, because Whenever you try and be strict at the national level, then your banking sector will come and say, oh my god, oh my god, level playing field, you can't do that. And at times it works, <laughs> let's face it. Or moreover, uh, the, uh, the political economy constraint, it's very unpleasant for unpopular, for politicians to uh, make it harder for these poor young households to buy a house. Therefore, I think these are the key things. And, uh, uh, these two biases mean that uh, this uh, top-up idea is a good idea. Uh, some people have said, why not uh, allow a more symmetric uh, intervention power, for example, for the ECB? I think the problem is that if both sides are allowed to go up and down and basically undo what the other side will have been done, basically you will not converge. You will have credits, you will have cycles policy cycles whenever you don't fully agree. Of course, if you fully agree, who cares? But if you don't fully agree, there will be the risk of a cycle. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, technical economics, uh, we could say that there, is, there exists no pure strategy in Nash equilibrium in this kind of case. So I don't think we want to change that. Uh, I think the current system where you can each uh, top up is, I think, the, the right way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for, for that very nice example of how you try to deal with this in, uh, from, a, uh, from a Belgian, Belgian uh, perspective when it comes to doing, do, doing a few things within this, this field. What all of this is all about is kind of market segmentation in one, uh, one way or the other, and maybe it's kind of heresy, but it's kind of raising the interest rate without raising the interest rate. That's, that's kind of the whole idea behind this mis sometimes we're not supposed to say that, but that's not actually how it works. Uh, I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Uh, to the whole issue of regional constraints, as far as I know, they are struggling through an attempt to regional constraints in Canada. 
because they have a, an enormous boom in Vancouver and, and not, they also have a boom in Toronto, but not, a, but not of a similar magnitude. So That's we'll right. see. We will see what will come out of the Canadian yeah. experiment uh, even, yeah. eventually, and that will be certainly be interesting to follow. Now, please, Richard, uh, floor is yours. Uh, tell us what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, but first, Matthias, I, I fully share your view that uh, granular policies are are great, but. Um, in the British case, London is a pretty big grain, so it may not be a very good example. <laughs> um, so um, before, uh, before I start, I, I want to second uh, the remarks by S Stefan this morning and uh, Matthias too now about ESRB. Uh, I thought when I looked at this, when, when it was first you know, mooted, first created, the structure, uh, this huge inclusive uh, body that had uh, 70 plus uh, people on it, couldn't possibly make any decisions and so on and so forth. And then when I first went to my first general board meeting, uh, you, you, you sit at, what, I was actually sitting at one end of the, of this, table and down at the other, I couldn't see who was down there, you know. Um, they give you this wonderful seating chart, uh, and that's good, uh, but even with the seating chart, it's sort of hard to tell who's talking when somebody intervenes from the other end of the room. Uh, still, a lot happens in the committees, and I may come back to that a bit, um, and the general board does make decisions, and occasionally it votes, uh, and so forth, and I think it has been uh, very effective. Let me also second uh, Marco's remarks about the prize papers. I too was on that review committee and I can confirm the competition was very strong. So th these are really outstanding pieces of work and I'm particularly pleased myself that they're empirical papers. Um, now, uh, to macro policy experiences. Well, I'm not a regulator. I never have been, I never will be. Uh, and uh, still, you know, ESRB needed someone from the Advisory Scientific Committee to co-chair the Joint Expert Group on Shadow Banking. So I volunteered for that, uh, and that is a Joint Advisory Technical Committee, Advisory Scientific Committee uh, group. And I soon discovered that on this group, I was the only non-regulator. There I am, I am an innocent, naive academic, uh, me supposed to co-chair this group of, of uh, 40 people, all the rest being officials. Um, I can say that the experience has been interesting. Uh, challenging is what they usually say, no? Uh, occasionally it's even more than that. The other day in a telco uh, among several of us, I made a remark and my excellent, ever vigilant co-chair immediately laughed and said, Richard, you just hit a hot button. I haven't yet had the chance to ask him why the button was hot, whom I might uh, already have offended, uh, and what line I crossed. But, you know, that's the role of academics. So what can I contribute here? Uh, fortunately, the others on this panel do have first-hand experience. My natural response as an academic is to look at the evidence, and that requires going to the literature. Yesterday, Javier uh, Suarez expressed his disappointment that there's so little literature on the macro policy stance. There seems to be more on macro policy experiences and effectiveness. Still not enough. That's partly a data issue. Uh, it's not so much there a question of what's in the public domain, but rather a problem of short time series. Still, we do have cross-section papers and some panel regressions. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a moment. I won't talk much about shadow banking, which is the realm of that expert group uh, that I'm on. Uh, and here the data still are patchy. We have, I think, made a good start with the first annual shadow banking monitor and the methodological uh, and data paper that we published simultaneously with it. And I do strongly recommend these to you. Still, we've only begun to use the immense body of data that uh, are the data that are now being generated because of the regulations, the AIFMD, EMIR, Solvency II, all this is resulting in 
enormous reporting. Of course, the institutions involved will tell you it's far too excessive reporting, but nevertheless, uh, for, uh, uh, for research and for trying to figure out what's going on and maybe uh, getting some evidence that will guide policy decisions, this, these are going to be tremendous resources. And I would note that the Advisory Scientific Committee, if I can put in a little plug here, started off the work on EMIR data that Tuomas spoke about uh, before launch today. Note also that academics can use these data, though they have to do so at least now, uh, in cooperation with uh, ECB staff. Um, I would like then to, um, uh, to turn to some of the empirical evidence on macro pro experience. Uh, and as I said, there is some relevant research. And let me just quickly go through some interesting pieces, some pieces that have caught my interest anyway. One is one that comes from the Bank of England uh, using panel data on 1,000 different macro pro actions taken by 68 countries. And a very clear result comes out that I think is important, that when home authorities raise capital standards, the home non-bank sector borrows more from foreign banks, a kind of regulatory arbitrage. We'll see that coming out in another study that I'm going to cite in a moment. There's, a, there's work by Lim and colleagues on cross country using cross-country panel regressions, 10 macro pro instruments, 49 countries. Again, you see the bodies of data out there are not trivial. Uh, many instruments turn out to be effective, both in reducing credit growth and reducing its pro-cyclicality. Pro AR and co-authors uh, look at domestic regulation that con constrains the lending by domestic banks and subsidiaries of foreign banks, that is to say within the purview, therefore, of the domestic rev regulator. And what does this do? Uh, it increases the lending by branches of foreign banks, not within the purview of the, domestic, of the home regulator, uh, and that lending, that is significant, in, in effect undoes about one third of the fall in lending that was induced by the regulation. And that's a rather important result, it seems to me. Uh, Ongena and colleagues uh, find that another kind of regulatory arbitrage, that, risked, that stricter home country regulation uh, increases the risk taking by multinational banks coming you know, risk-taking abroad, okay, outside of the regulatory purview again. CISEL and colleagues in a very recent paper uh, find that macro regulation of bank credit induces a substitution towards non-bank credit, that is to say, my little world of shadow banking. Uh, these substitution effects are stronger in advanced economies than in emerging markets, and there's a, there are similar results in an earlier paper uh, by uh, Ceruti and colleagues looking at 119 countries over 14 years. Uh, and there is a growing literature of that kind. The IMF uh, has a paper in 2014 uh, showing that more stringent capital requirements uh, brings about a growth in the shadow banking sector in various countries. We have case studies of a number of countries uh, on, especially on regi residential real estate mortgage lending. Uh, and that's just a, a, a panorama of what I think uh, is important that people should be looking at when they're thinking about uh, macroprudential regulation. But, you know, who cares about the evidence these days? We in the UK were told explicitly by a very senior politician whom I shall not name, uh, during the referendum campaign, that people don't want to hear any more from you experts, right? Uh, and, um, and indeed, uh, he's not the only one. Our politicians uh, in recent years seem to have moved away from evidence-based policy towards policy-based evidence. Uh, uh, but I'm afraid to say the private sector, the private sector uh, talks similarly. I was struck yesterday by a report that I that was just came out, a, a, a press report, of an extraordinarily violent attack 
on the Financial Stability Board by the Investment Company Institute, which is a trade lobby in the US that represents asset managers that are said to control in total $20 trillion of assets. So these are you know, this is a non-trivial trade association, no? Uh, they said that the FSB should just stop looking at asset managers and leave that entirely to IOSCO and national regulators with what they called, these, these are the people who have hands-on experience. Yeah? Uh, I think this is, hey, for starters, this is a bit much from institutions that have pushed back at regulation because they say it has supposedly resulted in a dramatic fall in market liquidity. They, of course, ignore extensive empirical evidence to the contrary, uh, amassed and, and uh, brought forward by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, by the Bank of England, and others. Uh, putting that aside, the key point is that the raison d'etre of both ESRB and FSB is that you can't leave macro pru to national regulators only. Many of the systemic issues justifying macro pru have major uh, cross-border elements. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I agree with Mathias, uh, and I don't contest the studies that he cites about national differences, but, um, but I think these uh, cross-national and, um, uh, and global factors that I'm going to finish with uh, are really important. Um, uh, Marco referred to the relations between banks and non-banks, between banks and shadow banks, and a little publicity again. We, uh, the Joint Expert Group on Shadow Banking, are doing a study of interconnectedness between banks and shadow banks using the EBA data on exposures. And a first pass at the data here finds that about 60% of EU banks' exposures to shadow banks, to non-banks, let's call them shadow banks, were to entities outside the European Union. 60%, okay? Uh, and that, um, uh, that, it seems to me, is just a, is a very important illustration of uh, these last general points that I'm going to finish with. Uh, the uh, international macroeconomic and financial experience, and that's really my, my game is international macro and finance. Um, uh, that literature, uh, the part of that literature that's relevant to macro pru, uh, establishes several points that, with which I conclude. One, there is a global financial cycle, and it is indeed global, right? And second, Contagion from shocks is often also global. Should the French regulator, for example, now this is just an example, not coming from the literature, but from experience, should the French regulator deal with the French bank's exposures to US money market funds differently from the way the German regulator would deal with its bank's similar exposures, given that the shock is going to be the same? Right? Uh, if there is a major shock, both may need both the French and the German banks may need dollar liquidity, and it would be nice to have some coherence and consistency in the way that decision, those decisions are made and that liquidity is supplied. Uh, excessive credit growth coming partly from capital inflows is typically, of course, a global issue. There are obvious possibilities, and some raised in the literature that I cited before, for cross-border regulatory arbitrage. And finally, banks typically know very little about the supervisory treatment of their foreign shadow banking counterparts. And as I've said, uh, that foreign exposure is, can be enormous. All this, uh, I conclude, is strong support for the role of the ESRB and its committees. We are learning a lot about macro proof through experience, through evidence, but there is now much more data uh, becoming available much more to learn. And I'm very excited myself to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for, for, for touching on, on, on these cross-border issues, because that's something that all of us live with in a European context, and Anneli and myself certainly know a, a bit about these things in the, in, the, in the Nordic Baltic region, because basically all our banks are cross-border in, <laughs> in, in, in one form or the other, because all of them are all over the place. So whatever you do is going to be cross-border. One one way or the other, and it's just 
has to be dealt with at the, at, at the technical level. So, Paul, thank what's you, up? Thank you, what Stefan. What do you think about all this? <clears throat> Francesco, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's nice to be at an ESRB um, event again. I was very glad when I occupied the UK seat on the ESRB, although it was, it was not only, as Richard said, a table with lots of people around it. Um, the table wasn't quite big enough, for, um, so that I've never been at a more crushed yeah, table. Yeah, yes, <laughs> Adair and I, we've taken turns who would sit on um, whose lap um, for which agenda item. No, and uh, can I just say that um, I'm delighted to find that Stefan is still the chair of the key subcommittee. I think that Europe has been very lucky, Stefan, to to have you in that chair and to make the commitment that you have given your, both your domestic duties and the fact that you chair the um, Basel um, committee. The, 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 the second thing I should say is that um, the remarks I'm gonna make this afternoon um, draw on a paper about the design and purpose of financial stability regimes that the Canadian think tank, SIGI, um, published a couple of days ago. It's, 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 it's very long, so I'm not urging anybody to, um, to read it. In, in a way, what Richard and, and Matthias have said sets up um, what I want to urge you, um, particularly those of you in the official sector, to, to think about. Th th this morning, we heard a, um, a really rich and fascinating exchange between Claudio and Vitor, um, which really was about what are the purposes of monetary um, policy. I think it's healthy that that debate is there. But if you think that we must have spent 25 years trying to think very carefully about the design um, of monetary policy regimes, what were the costs of inflation, was there long-run ne neutrality, super neutrality, which instruments worked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's, there's nothing remotely similar to that body of work. Um, in the financial stability area. There isn't even a single paper um, that is, is stripped down in the way that Barrett Gordon does um, to demonstrate that there's time inconsistency problem. And Olivier Blanchard and I have discussed this. Um, the kind of political cycles that you get in quotes macro prudential policy, is that to do with the shifting preferences um, of politicians or is it to do with hyperbolic discount rates or is it actually what a period by period um, social planner um, without changing objectives would do? It is absolutely amazing that there's not a paper that kind of pins that, that down. And I don't think, when I was in office, I didn't think that mattered very much in 2009, 2010, 11, when we were kind of reshaping the world because we had to get on with it. I do think there's now a bit of a, um, a problem, and I'm, I'm going to give a couple of biggish illustrations, but just drawing on what Richard and, and Matthias said, um, and I'm certainly not trying to pick holes in what you said at all. I, I agreed with almost everything you said, but it just illustrated what, some of the things I want to get at. So Richard, um, I mean, there are just endless, endless papers on the effectiveness of macro prudential instruments, but I, I was brought up as a public policymaker to be effective at what, effective at what, objective, and it's having an objective and framing it within a regime that manages um, to harness um, expectational effects and gets you into a world of regime change. And I don't think anyone can know anything very intelligent about the effect, quotes, effectiveness um, of any of these instruments um, unless they are placed within a regime um, which has a, a reasonably clear articulated and monitorable um, objective. Now, Matthias illustrated my concerns in a slightly different um, way in that um, um, he said fairly unequivocally that the objective ought to be um, the resilience of the financial system, whatever, whatever that means. I think one can unpack that, and for what it's worth, um, although this is going to remain bracketed for much of what I say, I agree with that. But then, as you described the various things being done in Belgium and around the world, and when Stefan, you came in with um, Canada, I was left thinking, well, if, if, it's trying to dampen down the Vancouver housing market to do with the resilience of the Canadian financial system, or is it to do with the misallocation of resources in, in Western um, Canada? Now, 
those are just a kind of preamble. Um, the diversity in financial stability regimes, and I'm deliberately using the word financial stability regimes around the world, um, is extremely useful in terms of um, different experiments being conducted, um, but is reveals the degree to which there is no consensus of what financial stability policy um, is for. And I, I'm going to um, start off with some exhibits, I'm afraid. So exhibit one is the EU Commission's um, consultative document review of the EU macroprudential policy framework. And I should declare that I'm a consultant. I'm advising the EU Commission on the resolution of clearing houses, so I would make clear that association. Um, I, I've, I've skip read this document. It's too long for anyone human to read. Um, but I, do, I don't think that the purpose and objective of a macro prudential policy framework is specified in this document um, anywhere. My second exhibit is a more recent paper by the IMF, the FSB, and the BIS, M Elements of Effective Macro Prudential Policies, Lessons from International Experience, and as a cheap aside, fantastically self-referential document where the only things referred to are papers by the IMF, the <laughs> FSB, and the BIS, and actually lots of them, and, and extremely um, good, and some, and some of them um, written before I retired, and they're particularly good. Um, but, and, and there is a hint, there is a hint in this as to what financial stability policy or macroprudential policy might be about, which is, as Matthias said, that it's about the resilience of the system. But quite what it means to have an objective of the resilience of the system, what it would be to set an independent agency, an objective for the resilience of the system, um, and have the policymakers be highly insulated from day-to-day -day politics is nowhere um, addressed. So that too, I don't know really what that document is about, even though no doubt I would have agreed to it had I still been in office. Um, um, the, the third exhibit is actually from the ESRB, and I am actually making an extremely serious point, but I can't help the, the, the joke stuff. And in paragraph 12 of Macroprudential Policy Beyond Banking, an ESRB strategy paper, it says the ESRB regulation, so this is a law, defines systemic risk, which I take to be the purpose of the um, ESRB, is the risk of disruption in the financial system with the potential to have serious negative consequences for the internal market and the real economy. And my very good friend, Vitor Constancio, one of whose speeches I'm about to deconstruct, which is not the reason why I say he's my very good friend, of course. Um, he defines it similarly. Similarly, um, at the European Central Bank, this is in a speech he gave earlier this year, Vitor Constancio, Principles of Macroprudential Policy. And my summing up is going to be, well, we may have some principles for macroprudential policy, but um, Vitor left out the key paragraph, which is, so what's the objective? And he starts off telling us, in a way, and very similar to yours, to the risk that, the financial inst that financial instability significantly impairs the provision of necessary financial products and services by the financial system to a point where economic growth and welfare may be materially affected. I like that, and it's, that's the kind of thing which um, the Bank of England um, has as um, its objective, I believe, because I helped write the legislation. But then Vitor goes on. When he sets out his, for his principles, macroprudential policy should be preemptive and strongly countercyclical. Well, so if you had a, an objective of resilience, where what you were concerned about is the collapse of the financial system, not the boom in itself, not the social costs of the boom, but the social costs of the bust, where the bust leads to the collapse of the financial system and the cessation or the suspension or severe impairment of the provision of the core financial services of payments, um, risk capital and credit supply, and risk transfer, you would be interested mainly in a static regime um, where you had crushed the probability um, of collapse to whatever probability you decided you wanted to um, achieve, which I will 
um, come back to you. And you wouldn't start off, and you would say that first. And you would then have to explain um, why there was any dynamic policy at all. And the dynamic policy wouldn't be to do with curing um, credit booms per se. So there is something strange going on here. And I'll give you one more example, which is which I think reveals the extent to which this is serious. So in New Zealand, another very good friend of mine, Graham Wheeler, who I must have known for 25 years, um, has been setting LTV or LTI caps or limits or whatever um, on the New Zealand housing market um, for whatever purpose. Um, something to do with financial stability. And they seem to work everywhere except in Auckland. So then they introduced LTI or LTV caps limits for Auckland. Um, which in London, I guess it would just be parts of London. You know, would you have to have Hackney as well as Chelsea and Kensington? Would you need the whole of Kensington? Or would you, perhaps not West Kensington, where I live, which isn't quite as rich? Um, and you can see then that actually it's unlikely that the whole of the UK banking system would be exposed to West Kensington or that the Canadian banking system is overly exposed to Vancouver or perhaps even that the... Um, New Zealand system is exposed overly to Auckland. So what's going on? And the thing that is missing in all of these documents is what kind of social cost is it that we are bothered about? And there are two kinds of social costs um, that are associated with the pathologies, the frictions, the externalities, if you like, um, in finance. Um, and one of these I've talked about, which is collapse, which we know is associated with the fire sales and interlinkages, and I like to add the discontinuities in bankruptcy. But there are also um, social costs from booms, uh, that either economy-wide boom, credit booms, or sectoral credit booms, that do not end in the collapse in the financial system because you have ensured that your financial system is highly resilient. And we may care about those social costs um, two, because they lead to the misallocation of resources, and one manifestation of that is that they can lead to over-indebtedness, which, even when the bubble deflates, doesn't burst, it just deflates, may arrest, um, may produce economic headwinds of the kind that exist um, at the moment. And these two things seem to me to, to you would, if, if you're trying to do the second of those things, which I think some authorities may be trying to do around the world, um, independent authorities, how, how are we, the public, to know how well they're doing? Um, so when they have avoided or mitigated the misallocation of resources, um, how are we to know that actually resources were allocated, I don't know, completely efficiently or... or only one standard deviation away from some measure of efficiency or, or whatever. And how are, how are people to oversee um, all of this? How are we, are to, how are we to know um, whether it is um, um, working? And uh, there's some more I could say about resolution policy, um, resilience policy, but I won't. Um, I'll sum up by saying I, th I think that there was a whole group of us, certainly including Stefan and I, um, <coughs> who, after the crisis, were saying this was a problem of a missing regime. We had a regime for nominal stability, but we didn't have a regime for financial stability. And it seems to me that, actually, with hindsight, there was more than one missing regime. And there, was a, there are lots of regimes that were missing. There's a, there's, a, there's a regime for systemic stability or systemic resilience. There is a, there is a missing regime for what I think of avoiding national balance sheet vulnerabilities. There may be a missing regime for avoiding um, the misallocation of resources through financial booms. There's certainly a mis missing regime at the global level for international um, macroeconomic um, balance. And my worry is that the politicians, or some politicians and parts of the public, may think that you, those of you that are in office, can now do quite a lot of these things. And you may not be able to do um, some of them. And actually, some of them may sometimes be in your mind on other occasions not in your mind. And I think that is, at the level of principle, a deeply unhealthy place 
for independent authorities to be. But quite apart from my peccadilloes about the rule of law and, and democracy, um, it's not going to be very effective. Only, only if you know and can convey what your objectives are, if you know what you're doing when you come in um, in the morning, can you harness the expectational effects um, that are crucial to a good policy regime? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. On that, on, on, on that note, I mean, one of the one of the trade-offs here, and this is this is not so easy, and that's why you find so many different uh, macroprudential frameworks all over the world is to deal with the whole issue. Of who's supposed to say no, and who's supposed to have the right to do that? And, and there are different countries end up in different corners. Uh, my own country is a good, good example of that, where, where the politi politicians have made it abundantly clear that they are the ones who are supposed to say no. So far, they have not been willing to say no, but yes. that's a different issue. That's a completely different issue. They made it absolutely clear that it's not for, not for civil servants to do it. Uh, and uh, we don't know what the end, end game will be of that as of yet, but uh, here you have the same timing consistency issues that you actually deal with when you discuss monetary policy. And, and, and there, these are, I mean, truly, truly difficult uh, trade-offs. So, Anneli, tell us now what, how you are solving all this beautifully in Finland. Thank you so much. It's uh, quite a challenge to talk uh, after Paul. And first, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And second, I need to say how much I value the work of ESRB during the last years in macro oversight, in providing benchmarks, in peer pressure, it's been really good. And without the SRB, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have the framework in place. And what is also part of the richness of the SRB is that we have all the different uh, sectors there, insurance, banking, securities, uh, central bankers. It, we haven't maybe utilized all all the, the good uh, things that we have, but in the future, I'm sure, uh, with the growing uh, shadow banking or the, or the CMU, uh, there will be more and more um, uh, need for work in the non-banking area as well. And what, of course, is important from your point of view is that you get all the data you need in order to be able to do your work. So that, that is something that I really support. But uh, I, if I may, I would like to touch upon three topics. Uh, that's um, domestic uh, experience in macro prudential policy, uh, then a few words about the instruments, and then about these um, cross-border issues. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, so uh, in one of the recommendations of ESRB, a re recommendation was that the central bank should have a leading role in macro policy uh, issues. In my country, my small country, uh, we, the FinFSA, we are the macro prudential authority. But as we operate in conjunction with the central bank, uh, we actually benefit a lot from that cooperation meaning that actually much of the macro prudential analysis we get from the central bank. And that's been extremely useful in our everyday work. And also what we have, we have excellent relationship with the central bank, but also during the preparatory phase, we have very good cooperation with the ministries and especially with the Ministry uh, of Finance. And therefore we, until now, we have managed to, on expert level, before we are at the decision-making phase, we have already managed to, to reach a consensus about the actions to be taken. And of course, cannot be the case always, but until now, it has worked extremely well and smoothly. So that was the, the um, domestic side. And uh, in our report, we have representatives from the central bank and the ministries. So all the, all the different parties are, are involved in the uh, decision-making process. But uh, when it comes then to the, the, the instruments that we are uh, 
have been using ours and are supposed to use. So um, I have a few comments on those. So far, uh, we have activated the uh, OSI buffers. We have LTV. Uh, we have go gone through the counter-cyclical buffer process, of course, quarterly. And there one could ask why on earth quarterly in normal circumstances, because quarterly is quite often. I mean, the figures do not change that drastically. And as Matthias said before, also there, the, we should really look at the assessment criteria. It cannot be only credit growth uh, to GDP growth. You need to take household indebtedness, indebtedness and, and external balance of economy, other factors into account as well. But uh, that also, I find it pretty smooth process. So uh, I don't have any, any complaints about that. But then when we, we have very, uh, the IRB banks in Finland, they, some of them have very low risk weights. And when we started to think which instruments to use when we want to, to uh, increase the risk weights, so it wasn't that straightforward. We looked at Article 164 and, and noticed that that, uh, instrument would actually end up with the wrong uh, outcome. I mean, the, uh, not the right banks would be penalized. And then we looked at Pillar 2. But as you know, in Pillar 2, you have many authorities who are the decision makers. Uh, there are disclosure issues because some authorities, authorities micro authorities, do not disclose uh, the Pillar 2 requirements. Then there is no reciprocity. And, and one bank becoming a major branch uh, um, in the foreseeable future. So the reciprocity issue is very important from our point of view. And also, um, our banking sector is, well, well, they're extremely well capitalized. So the Pillar 2 wouldn't have any actual impact. So what we had left, we had the extremely, I hope I do not offend anybody, <laughs> cumbersome and bureaucratic and time-consuming Article 458. And I cannot understand. I know that it's like the last straw that you should use. But I cannot say, I cannot understand why it has been made so difficult. And I mean, I would have thought, I would have, <laughs> not your fault, Francesco. Uh, uh, I would have thought that it's every, in everybody's interest that if you see a problem, you need to fix it. So why to make the fixing so extremely cumbersome? That is my question. And that is certainly something that has to be, has to be solved. Uh, when it comes to the other instruments, the toolkits, so um, if I think of the uh, instruments regarding the really the existing loan stock, so we don't really have any instruments, as far as I know, regarding that, because you cannot have uh, any rules regarding amortization, regarding the current loan stock. You can only, only uh, then tackle the um, new issuance. Uh, of course, you can resti restrict amortization holidays, but that's another story. And what I think also that the exposure-based and institution-specific toolkit in the CRR and the CRD4, that is pretty comprehensive. But uh, I said this many times before that in the EU, we do not have a macroprudential toolkit of instruments which have proven, I think, the most effective. And I understand there is also uh, experience of that. And these are the borrower-based instruments like LTI, uh, DSTI, LTV. And of course, we all understand that these instruments can be politically and socially extremely sensitive. And you do not become very popular when you activate them. And there might be lots of political pressure. So therefore, it's extremely important that we get guidance from the center that we have a common uh, EU framework also regarding these instruments. I 
understand that many disagree with me, and, but what I emphasize is that at least in the design of these instruments, we would need to have more harmonization. When it comes to the application of these instruments, I quite agree with those who say that it should be with the national authorities, because the national authorities know best what they need in their domestic markets. But if you don't have any harmonization of the design, that would also mean that you couldn't, at least in my opinion, you couldn't analyze how effective these instruments in real world are, and you cannot really uh, compare different countries with each other. And also about the sensitivity of these instruments, well, uh, as I said, uh, in our legislation uh, starting July this year, we have now the uh, LTV. Uh, well, it's not actually LTV, it's LTC because after heavy lobbying in Finland, uh, it uh, changed its character, and now it's loan to collateral, and meaning in practice that it's uh, a much less effective tool. But then, um, then the, uh, about the uh, European level playing field in the use of macroprudential instruments, well, when it comes to the OSI buffers, I don't think there's too much uh, uh, level playing field or consistency when it comes to their calibration. And some of us, macroprudential authorities, use a pillar two instrument, some do not. Some disclose pillar two, some do not. In the SSM, we have a topping up. In other countries outside SSM, not. And the topping up, as was said previous, previously, I think it's extremely valuable because it might be that there is inaction bias amongst uh, national supervisors, so the, the topping up helps. So my, 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 in concluding this part, I would say that uh, we need national flexibility in application, but more harmonization in design. But then also my favorite topic, Stefan knows already what I'm going to talk about. Yes, you can, you can almost say it um, without me saying anything. Uh, so in the current CRD uh, regulatory framework, the supervisory powers of the branch supervisor, they are extremely limited uh, in relation to prudential supervision. And the CRD doesn't really recognize uh, systemically important branches with a significant market share in their host country. So what I argue is that this branch structure as such is apt to weaken the macroprudential analysis in host countries. Because in my opinion, data and supervisory information of the home country should be made available also the host country designated authority. And uh, I would very much uh, prefer if the uh, host countries could also be uh, play a role in the policy making process. But of course, what is the most important thing is the reciprocity. As we know in, in Pillar 2 and OSIS, there's no reciprocity. E SRB, you can request. But uh, when it comes to the mandatory reciprocity requirements, they, I think, for instance, they should cover all exposures whether they are through branch or cross-border transactions in the host country. So the host country macro measures should be extended and cover all these exposures, and there should really be level playing field between different banks in that, in that host country. And uh, of course, if the, if the home country doesn't have the, the uh, legal measures to do that, so the, the next best alternative is that uh, um, it tries to use tool that has the most equivalent effect, because I think it's in uh, both countries' interest that the 
macroprudential measures are effective also in the host country. And having talked about the, the Nordic context, the Baltic context, uh, banks operate cross-border or through branches or at the moment subsidiaries. And of course, the risk is that there is a lot of, there could be a lot of spillover effects. Thank you. No, Anneli, I think our region is, is, is really one of the one of the laboratories when it comes to cross-border banking. So your, your points are, are highly, highly relevant when it comes to dealing with this. In addition, you mentioned the difficulty of dealing with loan stocks. If you have ended up in a corner where you feel that the stock of outstanding loans is just too much, and then it takes decades to work, mm. work your way through that. And, and that's where it gets difficult also with whatever it is we call macroprudential, because then you also start to getting very, very close to fiscal policy and monetary policy, because both fiscal policy and monetary policy, they hit the stock yep. immediately, yep. Yep. big time. Uh, while most of the macroprudential measures are kind of at the margin, fiddling around, tweaking this, that, and the other. So in, 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 an, in, in an ideal world, what we are really talking about is some kind of a policy coordination of the whole thing. Yeah. But with these interest rate levels, they are not that uh, effective. No, that's correct. That, that, that's correct. But then you are f essentially full circle yeah. back to fiscal policy. Yeah. And then, of course, the whole thing becomes a highly yeah. political yeah. issue yeah, because sure. you can easily <coughs> increase the cost of borrowing by, for example, doing, way, doing away or reduce interest rate deductibility for tax purposes. And that immediately affects the entire stock. And this, of course, uh, varies enormously from country to uh, country to country. So we have heard uh, four very, very interesting interventions. How one can have different views and reflections on, on what we are trying to uh, achieve. Uh, Matthias, any additional comments to, to what you have heard? Um, well, um, I think, first of all, uh, the, uh, the, I agree with the points made by Anneli. I think our, our various experiences are pretty uh, pretty similar. Uh, we also have a concern uh, about uh, as, a, as a host supervisor at times, and so uh, I think I, I share what, uh, what she said. Uh, on Richard, I, I fully agree that, uh, that uh, cross-border links are really, really important, and I, I thought that his uh, number on 60% of the links, if I understood well, of EU banks to non-banks were with respect to institutions outside the EU. That's indeed uh, yeah. quite, uh, quite uh, impressive. And uh, on, on Paul's uh, comment about, yes, indeed, uh, the, the difficulty of macroprudential policies, that it has a number of objectives. And uh, uh, at times, it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not obvious that they are defined so, uh, so explicitly. And therefore, the issue of accountability can be, can be a problem. Um, at some level, indeed, resilience is kind of uh, even though you have to define it a bit better, but uh, but somehow I guess we are reasonably comfortable with what uh, what that means. But indeed, uh, we are talking about more than that on huh? the cyclical part on uh, fighting bubbles. Uh, I think there uh, the uh, the efficiency is is I think clearly much more limited, uh, and uh, more work is is needed to try and uh, improve the. Uh, the uh, the policy the set of policy tools and uh, and indeed the, the whole question of what success means I think is very uh, is very complicated because there there is no counterfactual of them so uh, hmm. I think on that front it's it is quite a challenge. Richard, two quick remarks. One on on Paul's uh, point about the that the evaluation of the effectiveness of policies has to place them within the relevant policy regimes. Uh, yes, um, sure, uh, but you know you can do that um, in event studies. You can do that in case studies. You can do that in fashionable randomized controlled trials. But uh, um, but in cross country empirical work, the best that you can do is just introduce as many c appropriate control variables. Um, as you as you can, uh, uh, with uh, tr trying to retain a reasonable number of degrees of freedom, and that's um, you know 
it, 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 you might say, well, all that cross-country panel data stuff um, is, um, is very weak because it doesn't situate the, each of the individual measures in its context. And I, I don't think there's any comeback to that. Uh, it's a Lucas critique, right? Sorry? It's a Lucas critique. Well, it could be, yeah. Um, um, it could be. Uh, but, um, but anyway, uh, that's, that's the, the other point uh, uh, about Annelie's remark uh, that, that there ought to be a, a common EU framework for the design of a number of these policies, including loan to value and loan to income ratio policies. I, you know, uh, what would you say then about the Bank of England's policy measure to uh, impose particular loan to value ratios on a proportion of the high value uh, property loans that are made um, uh, in London in particular. Uh, very specific, but Mark, you know, Mark Carney, I can recall him standing up at a meeting, I don't know, sometime less than a year ago with, he had one slide, it was a lovely slide. It showed the shift in the distribution of the values of mortgages that had come about um, after, I won't say in consequence of, but it's pretty obvious, um, after this measure was, uh, was adopted. And, um, and it was quite impressive, very effective measure, it appears, um, and I think did help to uh, to slow things down in the London property market. Now, you know, would uh, would would common regulations um, permit uh, something quite so specific and and focused as that? Paul, um, two comments. In, in a way, I think Anneli's description of the branch point. It's probably a better illustration of what I'm trying to get at than any of my illustrations. Um, so imagine you've got a, a relatively small country and a big country, and a bank, a big bank from the big country has branched into the small country, and it's got very loose credit conditions there that is pushing up house prices or whatever you like. But however much money it loses, it's not going to damage the bank, and the bank is completely committed to, I'm going to kind of impose this as an assumption, completely committed to being in the small country. So the resilience objective is just met. Um, you just allow the bubble. And you say, well, actually, that's interesting. Um, oh, there's something else going on. Well, another way to think about this for the, most of the room is an economist. I mean, if, if you think about Musgrave's um, threefold categorization of the functions of the fiscal state, God, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, the allocative branch and the distributional branch and the intertemporal stabilization branch. Well, central banking has typically been thought to be part of the intertemporal stabilization branch, nominal stability. And that was quite important in terms of um, reestablishing um, the extraordinary powers that Montague, Norman, and Benjamin Strong gave away, essentially. And you got it back, we got them back in the 80s and 90s, well, now you're in the allocative branch and as well. And how far do you want to be part of that branch? This is a world of, of Pigouvian taxation um, and cozy and property rights and cap and trade. And how, how far are you um, going to go? And do the, do the politicians understand what you're going to do? You are the most powerful unelected people in the world after the constitutional um, courts. And in this area, you don't have very well-defined regimes. That's my first point. The second point, if I may make it, make it, and this is something a point I made to the Bank of England staff again and again, people don't even know in a world of transparency what the sign is when you raise capital requirements, whether it's risk weights or anything else. Because this isn't like monetary policy, where since the 80s, early 90s, all of the data is out there. There's essentially no private information other than they're trying to top, they out there are trying to top up their view in a Bayesian way of your reaction function. In this field, you've got loads of private information. So if you say we're worried about X and we are um, tweaking our macroprudential capital instrument 
um, by delta k um, for the following reasons. You're doing two things. You're both revealing your action and you are revealing your concerns. So say that they are already worried about um, um, the market and they're relieved that you have finally realized that something needs to be done and that you've done more or less um, enough. Um, in those circumstances, raising capital requirements may actually bring about um, an easing of credit um, conditions. Now imagine um, that they've got no idea, because they've all been you know, in the exuberant phase of the cycle, delusional, um, Schleiferian, myopia, et cetera. Um, and you, you come out and you say, well, we're doing, we're doing Delta K and we're doing it because of this, because it's really awful, you know. And they say, damn, we never thought about that. It's really awful. God, have they done enough? Don't know. Um, you, get a, you get a tightening in credit conditions. And I can give you loads of other examples. And you're going to discover this if you do it. Um, and I don't care what the empirical results show. You are going to discover that as you do things and you reveal the information for doing them, you won't even know the sign um, in all of the circumstances because you are, you are revealing um, information. And this is in almost none of the papers about it. So ill-defined objectives, extraordinary insulation from politics, and you can't even be sure of the sign on the partial derivative. I mean, you know, this is really serious stuff. <laughs> Thanks. I, I saw the comments made before uh, regarding resilience, and, and then uh, one comment more I would like to uh, make about the, the brand um, supervision being that uh, uh, we have extremely good cooperation between uh, supervisors in, in, in Nordic and Baltic countries, but might be that uh, somewhere the, the cooperation is not uh, that good and the, the um, uh, home supervisor is not that vigilant. So for that reason, we would need to something uh, more firm, some yeah. legal base, and that is important. Uh, about the LTV instruments, they are now a national instruments, so uh, of course they can be of any design whatsoever. But there was one comment made that I think is extremely important, that and the, the comment was, you cannot leave macro proof to national regulators only. And there I could not agree more. And there ESRB is the one who is in charge. And what is also important that you are now starting to do the, the uh, country uh, analysis, because without that, you cannot see the whole picture completely. Thank you, Anneli. It's late in the day, but still, if there might be a few questions from the audience, we'll take two or three of them. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the Germans at Maya. So, so the, the issue of, of granularity of macro proof was repeatedly raised by different panelists. So, I, at the end, I was wondering: is there a consensus on on how granular? Macro pro might want to get, uh, or, or or not. So I mean, you, um, Matthias gave a, an example where it's, which seems very obvious. You want to distinguish between say lending conditions in the housing sector and among SMEs. With with regional differentiation, I already find it not so obvious for reasons that were raised by by Paul. No. So if if you assume that you have say nationwide buffers. Uh, so that the bursting of a regional housing bubble will not threaten the stability of your banking system, say, is it, is it your duty to also prevent a regional bust if by doing that you know that you're creating a trade-off by excluding uh, even more people from the, from the housing market? I don't know. I mean, there is no answer to that as of, uh, <laughs> as, as of yet. It's just that, I mean, I think Paul and Anneli and myself gave a few examples where these issues sort of pop up. But there is no kind of organized European or international conversation on this topic. It's just that it shows up here and there, and then you have to you have to kind of deal with it as best as you well, as, as best as you can. I know from my part of the world a completely different example where we mismanaged the whole thing because clearly Swedish banks were quite yeah. helpful making the Baltic countries go more or less bust. 
and, and it would have been helpful if that could have been stopped. And it was a huge mistake not stopping it. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of Paul's example when you yeah. have a large country lending a ton of money into a small country and you just can't get a handle on it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you need to, your community needs to take these issues to the politicians. I don't, I don't mean tomorrow because they're not well enough thought through. But, you know, you need to do sufficient research to be able to take the question to the politicians in a controlled way. Matthias. Yes, no, I mean, uh, indeed, it's a, a complicated question. Uh, I mean, I guess one can say that the, uh, the optimal amount of granularity is higher than uh, the, uh, the capital counter cyclical buffer of Basel. <laughs> I think that we can all agree on. Yeah. Then, indeed, it will be case by case. And there is a risk. We talk a lot about inaction bias. I think there can also be a risk of uh, over-activism because it's yeah. so nice to push this button and that button and this button yeah. if we are allowed to. Uh, but uh, so I think it is. Uh, I think it's a very good research question, Richard. Yeah. No, this is this is where we we do need research. We do need models. I mean, you know, uh, is this is the issue here qualitatively different from uh, the problems that face monetary policy? in a reasonably large country. I can recall Eddie George uh, going up and speaking in Newcastle and saying, you know, um, uh, it uh, may be that we have a, a policy that's going to, uh, that's needed to cool things down in London, but it's going to create unemployment in Newcastle. Sorry about that. You know. <laughs> Francesco, did you have a question? First of all, thank you very much for all the appreciations for the, for the SRB. But of course, we have to be also, uh, to a certain extent, uh, reflective on what could be the weaknesses and what, what may have not been gone wrong, so uh, not well. So I wanted to ask you one question. This is a doubt, uh, a question I have myself on this, uh, this year. So it's, the, it's the following, that we have been constantly confronted with the question of uh, the choice of time for action. Uh, at the beginning, for example, we had the big crisis. Uh, everything uh, was in a very severe difficulty. We have been operating with a great self-restraint uh, because we could not almost say nothing. Otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. issues uh, would have been worsened. Um, now we have the problem uh, that clearly the public opinion is less and less ready to support macroprudential. Uh, we have a problem of a political system which is much more and more oriented to the question of, uh, uh, let's say, jobs, uh, growth, uh, this type of things we have. So is there not the risk that we will be finally ready to use the instruments, know what are the objectives, understand what is the, tra tra uh, the uh, me transmission mechanism, exactly the day in which the margins to operate in terms of what is the consensus in the society will have been decreasing very much. So who would like to answer? Matthias. Well, maybe just, I, it is true that uh, you see, you do see in Europe uh, a shift uh, towards uh, jobs and growth uh, rather than resilience in a sense. Uh, by the way, if it goes too far, maybe we'll go from, uh, from uh, post-crisis reform to post-reform crisis, and we can start again. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think, no, the point is that uh, it's better to be ready and develop the toolkit. And I think uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, the SRB has been pretty good at. And uh, I do think that still, especially since granularity is part of the, the thing, there are uh, quite a number of problems, uh, and the willingness to address them is variable, depending on the place, depending on uh, the politician. I, I don't think the, uh, my, I mean, today, uh, the counter-cyclical capital buffer, despite the fact that in some countries it's uh, not granular enough, is being in use in a number of countries. So it's not that nothing is happening. I, I do think that uh, uh, the, in that sense, uh, I think it's quite, quite helpful. I'm less pessimistic. With uh, Matthias's comments, because you were not pessimistic, you sounded a bit optimistic. Uh, let's, uh, this, because it's late on a Friday afternoon, let's, uh, let's call it a day. Uh, thank the panelists. 
but also say a heartfelt thank you, thank you to many ESRB staff who in a more anonymous role have helped out making this a very, very successful uh, conference. Thank you so much.